Please welcome Keith Brown. Thank you. I want to start by telling you something that I've been absolutely infatuated with since a very early point in time in my uh, childhood, actually. I want to take you back to the early 1980s, where I was 11 or 12-year-old boy, making that trip to Disneyland that we're all obligated to take as families. It was during that trip, again, as a very young boy, 11 or 12 years old, that I first saw the polarized technology that allows us to view almost all three-dimensional or stereoscopic content that we view in a movie theater today. But at the time, in the early 80s, that was really new and innovative technology. And I remember within the film that was running, there was a cherry orchard that we were in. And within that cherry orchard, it was like I was there. I could reach out. The, the director of the film that was going had us walking through a cherry orchard, but the three-dimensional effect was so impactful, I felt like I was there. I felt like I was absolutely in the cherry orchard, so much so that I could almost smell the blossoms that were on the trees, even though there was, as far as I know, no smell involved. <laughs> Fast forward a couple years later, I had the opportunity to go with my family to the 1986 World's Fair in Vancouver. At that 1986 World's Fair, I visited a attraction called Spirit Lodge, which was the General Motors attraction for talking about how they were using, utilizing technology for designing cars, but the way they demonstrated this technology was by having a holographic image of Native Americans around a fire talking about spirituality. Again, that, that exhibit won lots of awards, but it was also very similar to the first experience in the sense that I had a sense of presence there where I was, felt like I was actually there experiencing it, even though I knew it wasn't real. Fast forward, as, a, as the intro um, mentioned, in 2009, I had the opportunity to host a TV show about Montana. But really, the reason why we did that TV show was my, at the time, eight or nine-year-old boy, we were sitting in the living room watching one of the outdoor channels, and he said, Dad, we do this stuff all the time. Why aren't we on TV? I love it when little people <laughs> pose questions like that to you. I said, you know what? We could be on TV. And it, it also, um, something that I felt was changing in the world was that the TV industry and the media industry in general had yet to go through some pretty big fundamental changes. If you look at what the audio and music industry has gone through, it's gone through a transformational change. The way music is produced, the way it's distributed, and the way it's consumed has fundamentally changed over the last 20 or 30 years. TV and the way we consume entertainment content is yet to go through that same type of transformational move. It started to, but it hasn't yet. And so, having no experience at all within the entertainment industry, my son and I and, and, a, and a team of very close friends decided we would put together a pilot show. And it was a great opportunity to have an educational experience with my son as well. So we were all excited. We created this pilot show. We sent it into the TV station that we were watching. And it was also a great lesson in failure because they absolutely hated it. <laughs> but not wanting to give up and wanting to give a lesson in persistence, we passed it along to some of the other networks, and it was actually picked up. They liked it and it was picked up, and we did that for a year, and now I've got some great times documented with my son and my family. But I learned the media industry as well, which is important for the coming change that I think is yet to come. And I think we're right on the verge of that change. So I have today really the perfect TED Talk for you. I get to talk about technology, I get to talk about entertainment, and I get to talk about design, as well as how it impacts our overall communities. So first, let me take out the big crystal ball and make some very, very big, large predictions. This concept of the virtual universe is bigger than the internet. I believe it's bigger than the internet that we know today. Been around probably since the 50s. 
This concept and this, this idea of creating virtual, around, virtual worlds that we can explore ha has been around for a long time, but the technology is just now becoming available to really make it a reality. It's better than drugs. You get to go somewhere and, and uh, have a trip to some virtual place without having the physical side effects of drugs. Um, however, it's legal and um, it's still addictive. But being from the coffee industry, I kind of like businesses that are legal and addictive. <laughs> Beware because, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well, this is going to have a, 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 an absolutely big impact on our lives. So the movie The Matrix, the Matrix in 1999, Keanu Reeves had it just about right. So what is a virtual world? What is virtual reality? It's seeing, hearing, feeling, interacting with an imaginary world that is different than the real one. It's a simulation utilizing real video or computer simulated video that puts you in a place that is so real and so realistic that you actually have a presence in that space. I've heard it described as life inside a bubble or inside a sphere. So the technology exists today. I'm gonna show you some of it here in a minute. Um, puts you inside that sphere, and you're able to move around and interact with it. So 2015 is the year that the technology has now become good enough to give you that sense of presence by putting various technology components together. The speed of computing is there. The access to computing. We all carry around these devices now in our pocket mobile phones that are incredibly powerful computing machines. This cell phone can process and render data at 60 frames per second. When you go into a movie theater, watch a movie, that movie's at either typically 24 or 30 frames per second. So twice the ability to display images and process images is what we're currently used to in a movie theater today. So, a couple other props I want to grab right here. So this is an example video camera that takes 360 3D video. It consists of 14 little cameras, seven for the left eye, seven for the right eye. This is a device about the same size as a pair of ski goggles that has powerful optics in it when coupled with this cell phone that provides the brain in the screen to display the information that's been captured on this device or again, create a computer simulation of that. This puts, if you remember when you went to school, you probably had a picture, a flat picture, a two-dimensional picture of the globe on the wall in your classroom. All this does is put the 360 world, could be recording this right now, into that two-dimensional format for it to be processed later. So I wanna share with you a little video here. This is an example of that equirectangular image, if you will, of the globe. And imagine this applied, that's my deck on Flathead Lake, beautiful deck. So imagine that mapped onto the bubble on the inside, and I'm now looking around that bubble, and the optics in here are taking that image, the left and right eye, and I'm here, I'm absolutely on the deck. I don't know where you all are, but I, I'm definitely not giving a talk. I'm here looking at myself eating breakfast. This virtual world is clearly sped up, but it's absolutely realistic, and I was on my deck just there. This technology is truly bringing a new dawn of opportunity for us. 
So there I am running around taking pictures, <laughs> clearly sped up. But that, this technology, coupled with some other tools and entertainment tools for, of the future, think of virtual sets or virtual environments coupled with real world actors as well as avatars and then artificial intelligence, not just artificial intelligence for a human being, but artificial intelligence for birds, um, uh, dogs, <laughs> animals, and nature, to interact in a virtual world. All of that exists today, as well as the devices that allow you to touch and feel and interact in a, in, in a universal virtual world. The creativity that not only these tools that I just showed you will create, but the tools that I just rattled off, it is going to spawn who knows what. This technology, it, it's going to be like anything we've seen to date. So what are some potential applications? Everybody sees, and when people talk about virtuality, they naturally go to gaming. And they think about gaming as a, as a potential application here. I'll tell you with this, I've been playing with it for a while. Um, and it's just now starting to become available to the, to the general public. I've yet to play a game on it. Just because gaming doesn't really interest me that, that much. But what does excite me is potential medical applications or psychological applications, educational applications. Imagine to be able to teach history and be able to take somebody into Chernobyl and walk into the town and see what's happening there because we were able to take a robot in with this camera and then display it to somebody within that headset so they can actually see the impact of that. Or how about somebody that is confined to a wheelchair being able to allow them to walk the High Line Trail in Glacier National Park? Somebody with post-traumatic stress syndrome allowing them to, in a controlled manner, deal with that situation. The tourism industries would love to be able to promote, it's kind of a, the modern day convention visitors bureau on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so the applications of this type of technology are truly um, profound and will change um, how we consume content. Then, of course, there's industries like the porn industry. They say, wow, wait a minute here. This is, this is literally somebody that has a presence inside this. That could be rather stimulating. Of course, this is a family presentation, so I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the applications are far-reaching. Another story to tell you um, for how I utilize this camera. It was in a, tr in a tram. If you can imagine, this tram goes down about 30 stories uh, down a hillside, and it's, while it's going down at about a 45 degree angle, the view is amazing. And so I was at a dinner party, and this is a very popular entertainment item at a dinner party, by the way, and a good friend of mine, I'll change the name to protect the innocent, Tabby, I had her viewing this content, and she was in the tram, and she's looking around, and she's looking at the view, and she's kind of feeling the tram go down the hillside. She's really enjoying it. But yet, when I recorded that video, I was standing back here behind my camera in the tram, acting like I was grabbing the person. And I was wearing, because this was a cold February day, my fur hat, my ripped up flannel shirt, my, my uh, insulated pants. I, didn't, I look much different than I look, look now, but I'm sitting here acting like I'm interacting with the camera, which is the per person that's actually viewing this content. So she happened to, after a couple minutes of looking around and enjoying the views, she decided to explore what was behind her. She literally screamed and tipped over and jumped out of the, the, the chair that she was in. <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't have mace. <laughs> Because I would have been, you know, no concept of virtual base here because I would have been sprayed for sure. But it just shows the level of presence that this technology can bring because even though I was just playing around, I mean, she screamed and said, there's a big ugly dude trying to get me. And I, first, my feelings were very hurt because she was describing me as a big ugly dude. <laughs> but uh, it, it brought up, up, upon her the same feeling that she probably would have gotten by walking through a park and having a stranger jump out at her which I felt very bad about, even though 
I was just playing around with the technology. But she felt, <laughs> until she realized that that big scary dude was just me, <laughs> Um, she she had, went through all those same emotions. So what does this type of technology mean for our communities and how we can, can apply it? Sim Life, one of the most popular games of all time. Imagine what Sim Life might be in a virtual reality world, using the same artificial intelligence, some of the same <laughs> um, logic that went into that game. Might I be able to step into a completely virtual world? <laughs> sim my life? Sim maybe being married with a family? It's probably a little far-fetched from where the technology is right now, but it's not that far-fetched. Imagine this technology giving you such a sense of pre presence if you are playing a game, and let's say you're playing a war game that's so real, just like the example I just gave you, could it cause post-traumatic stress sy syndrome in the people playing the game? So just like any technology, it can be used for good, <laughs> or it could cause some potential, you know, certainly side effects. One, one other thing, you think about the marketing and you think about privacy, when you have that headset on, as we know from the recent introduction of watches that can measure your heartbeat, for example, while you're consuming content in that device, it's not too far-fetched to, for, for me to be able to measure your heart rate, where you're looking with your eyes, how your eyes are dilating. Market research tells us from a marketing perspective when people are about to make a buying decision, when they're happy, when they're sad. So being able to dynamically change the content in a virtual reality world could allow a marketer to maybe know what you want or don't want, probably before you know what you want or don't want. That can be pretty scary stuff. It can be pretty exciting stuff as well. So billions of, are gonna be made in this space. This time last year, Facebook acquired Oculus for about $2 billion. In order for them to get the return <laughs> on that acquisition, they're looking at this as potentially a, you know, is it a $4 billion return, is it a $5 billion return, is it a $10 billion return on this type of technology? They're betting it's very big, and that's just one company. So, is virtual reality real, um, or is it a passing fad, much like 3D was? Is it good or bad for society? I'm not here making a position one way or the other that it's good or bad. I think there's good applications, and there can certainly be some negative side effects, just like anything. Um, but the conclusion I would, would come to, if you believe this is as big as I do and, and some other companies do, when you look at a comparison of the internet, for example, the internet's only 19 or 20 years old. It's relatively um, young in the, in the age of how industries um, get formed. So companies like eBay, Amazon, Yahoo, they didn't exist <laughs> 19 or 20 years ago. So what type of companies are gonna be formed utilizing this technology and these tool sets now that we have for entertaining people? It's gonna fundamentally change the way we consume content and the way we, we entertain ourselves, or at least has the potential to do that. So what I leave you with is be thinking about what type of virtual world would you visit if you could? How, why, when would you do it? Be thinking about those opportunities that um, might rise out of this type of technology. So I see folks over here thinking about, wow, what type of technologies can I, can I, what type of industries can this work in? So thank you very much for allowing me to share this with you and just whet your appetite for what's possible here. So appreciate it.